Hi, good evening, and uh, thanks for everyone for coming along. We're going to be talking about continuous delivery and source control. Um, my name's Seb Rose, and I'm going to be acting as facilitator tonight. Um, and we have a, an illustrious crew of people, some of whom uh, I've met at various conferences, but most recently at Code in the Continuous Delivery Conference in Oslo. Um, uh, so we have four people. We've got um, Dave Farley, we've got Lars Krauss, we've got Mike Long and Olvin Model, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in their own order. So Dave, would you like to um, introduce, us, introduce yourself and sort of maybe state your initial position? Sure. So my name is Dave Farley. I'm um, one of the authors of the Continuous Delivery book. Um, I'm a consult independent consultant and um, a trainer and uh, software developer. My initial position is that I think that branching is generally a bad thing and we should be looking to avoid it and use continuous integration as our primary means of communicating and sharing information between within the team. Great, thank you. Um, Lars? Yeah, uh, my name is Lars Kruse. I'm uh, one of the partners in Pragma. Uh, I've been working with uh, version control systems and uh, and software configuration management and quality assurance for my entire career. I'm a software engineer. Uh, my viewpoint on branches is that uh, I simply love them. I mean, uh, in the end, uh, you're you're supposed to work in a in a in an isolated workspace, uh, whatever you want it or not, and it makes it so much easier to manage it when you're using branches. Uh, it allows you to have uh, multiple uh, workspaces in parallel. Uh, I'm a huge favor of continuous integration and continuous delivery. So uh, we have uh, come up with a workflow uh, using branches based on many years of experience that allows uh, these things to be combined in a in a in an efficient way. And um, yeah, so that's my viewpoint. Okay, thanks, Lars. Uh, Mike. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Mike. Uh, I'm also a partner at Krakma, but based in Oslo in Norway. Uh, I'm relatively new to this idea of working. I've worked on very big, slow projects, trying to bring them into a continuous delivery mindset. And I've also worked on very small, nimble projects that were they, they never really had any problems in that respect. So I'm more or less here to see what viewpoints can be challenged and what I can learn from this whole conversation. Thank you. Olve. Uh, yes, I'm uh, currently working for Cisco. I've been doing that for 11 years uh, with a fairly large code base for telepresence, uh, well, embedded software development, telepresence equipment. Uh, before that, I was working with the banking industry for four years, and before that, with the seismic industry, actually the same place as uh, Mike used to work. Uh, not at the same time, though, with uh, large seismic applications, seismic processing applications, typically 30 million lines of code, etc. Um, my, I've always been interested in kind of source control and and uh, and. and of course, when continuous integration came in as a, as a big thing, um, I immediately jumped on that train as well. But uh, the most important lessons that I've learned the last 11 years in, in Cisco is how important it is to make sure that the feedback loop is as short as possible. Uh, so my initial position is that whatever is slowing down the feedback uh, from a developer wants to check if this can be integrated or not is a bad thing. Uh, and that includes, for example, pre-checking, um, the automatic or mandatory pre-checking of, uh, of the commit before it goes into integration and the feedback can be given back. So that's my initial position. Okay, thanks, Olvi. So just to give a bit of context to people who, uh, who are watching this, uh, at the OSL Continuous Delivery Conference, um, I spoke to Mike and he showed me um, a little a little A5 printout of a, a Git workflow that Pragma had been had been working on and that Lars had blogged about. And we'll share with you the the link to that blog post. Um, and then later on in the day, 
uh, Olve gave a talk about uh, stating his position about how it was important to have really fast feedback loops. And I was uh, sitting in the audience tweeting away, and uh, Steve Smith, who unfortunately can't be with us tonight, um, started chipping in saying that uh, he thought there was a uh, there was a sort of tension between the the PRACMA recommended uh, source control approach um, and and continuous integration and continuous delivery. Uh, so to some extent, I guess Dave, you're 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 definitely um, a, an important contributor to the continuous delivery uh, discussion, having co-authored the book with the name, but also. Um, you're you're sort of channeling Steve because he he said that he was going to agree with everything that you said. So <laughs> given, given that he started off with from that position, um, and given that you you have that illustrious um, illustrious uh, position as the person who wrote the book, um, maybe you could uh, tell us what your thoughts are about the um, the paper that Lars and Pragma have published on the Josra website. Sure. So so I, so I. I uh, I, I guess I guess as part of my interest in continuous delivery, I, I, I'm 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 a hardline continuous integration guy. So um, so I, I agree that the the most important thing is a short feedback loop, and continuous integration is all about evaluating my changes alongside everybody else's changes as early and 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 uh, as I possibly can to get to get the fastest feedback that I can. Any form of branch branching of any kind is is about isolating change. That by definition, that's what branching is for. And so it seems to me that branching and continuous integration are kind of antithetical. That that they're, they're, they're kind of opposite ends of a, a, a of a spectrum. Of course, there are there are pragmatic points at which you know on a pre project one may have to be, one may be forced into a position to branch but it's my position that by default the normal everyday working processes branching has no no valuable role that I, that I perceive and certainly common practices in feature branching and certainly long lived feature branching um, are, are work against um, continuous delivery and so prevent us getting that early feedback that my changes aren't going to integrate properly with yours so so I think it I think it's it, it seems to me fundamental to continuous integration to be evaluating my changes as frequently as possible I I kind of added I kind of added something a, a little while ago um, Martin Fowler was kind of collecting up descriptions of continuous integration and one of one of the things that I added to the definition is that I think that if you're not um, if you're not committing at least once if you're not integrating your changes along with everybody else's at least once per day then you're not doing continuous integration I think if you're only doing it once per day you know it, it, it's a little bit questionable but there are times when that's that makes sense but if you're not you know and if you're having a, if you're using a branch to isolate, I don't see the value of a thing like a feature branch. If you if you're using you know less less than less than a day, you might as well be working on on master locally and com and committing your changes frequently. I, I see no role for a branch in that kind of operating circumstance. When Lars talks about being able to work on multiple streams at once, that's that's the sort of thing that that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up because I I think that's that's dangerous. It means it means it relies on on me as a developer being too smart and keeping all of juggling all of this stuff. And I would rather not do that. I would rather be focused on the work that I'm trying to do and trying to keep keep my think my stuff as simple as possible, so that I'm focused on on the business value that I'm trying to deliver, not the mechanics of how I organise my software and which which particular f picture of this the system I'm I'm looking at on a particular branch. Okay, um, so Lars, I think logically, if you'd like to step in there, do you? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to state that I totally agree that integration should happen at least uh, daily. So, so uh, I think that the branches here are being taken hostage a little bit because it's not the branches that the problem; it's the fact that you are not integrating daily that is the problem. Uh, so, so if you can have branches and you can continue to integrate daily, 
I mean, you are fighting a problem that is not there. So it's, it's not the branches per se that is the problem. I also fully agree that we should minimize work in progress. So I'm not either in favor of, uh, of having multiple processes uh, being run at the same time. But the thing is that if you have a version control system uh, and you are, um, you are working on something uh, that you want to commit to your colleagues, then for a period of time you will be working in an isolated workspace. Uh, it might be just you know for a day or so, but you will be working in an isolated workspace. Uh, if you're in Subversion, you do a checkout and you have your private workspace. If you're in Git, you will make a clone and, and you'll have your own repository to work in, but, but you will be in a private workspace. And the fact that, that you're in a private workspace actually uh, endangers the whole parallel process because somebody else might work on things that you are currently working on in your private workspace. So there's no guarantee that you will not end up in a situation where you might have to merge something in the end. Obviously, if you're integrating daily, hopefully that shouldn't you know, come too far astray from, from where you are. But, but you will end up in a situation where you will have to merge. So if you're in Git, for instance, uh, and you have your private clone, you'll be working on your master in your private clone, but you, you will have to end up delivering into a region master, which is in addition another branch. So the only thing that we're talking about here is actually that if you're in your own local clone, you should not work on your master. You should work on a different branch and then you should deliver that to the origin uh, uh, clone. We're also advocating that whatever you uh, want to uh, agree on with your teammates, as your definition of done, uh, what, whatever is supposed to be done uh, as a ritual or a test or whatever you have agreement with your colleagues about, what is the state of code that I can deliver to my colleagues. Typically, that would be something like, well, you're not supposed to break the code. So if it's, if it's, a, if it's a, a programming language that can compile, typically you will have to build it, right? It has to build before you can deliver it or whatever. Or it has to be completely finished. But no matter what, you will have to do some, some kind of, of testing, right? You will have to do a build or you have to execute your unit test, maybe you know, do some kind of uh, code analysis. I don't know what your definition of done is, but whatever it is, it is something that should be uh, held as, as your, your, your test as code, right? It should be executable by any developer in any context. And we're just saying that if you already automate this process, uh, then the most natural thing for you to, to be is, is that you would have some kind of a benevolent dictator governance model where you're not supposed to actually enter into your integration branch yourself but that would be guided by some kind of benevolent dictator saying that, well, we'll have a look at your code. And we just replace that with a willing surf, saying that uh, some kind of uh, automation platform like Bamboo or Jenkins or Go or whatever you're using uh, will take that request from you. So you're just raising a flag saying, I want in on the integration branch. And then the automation platform sees that immediately within seconds, and then it executes your definition of done, your toll gate criteria for entering into the integration branch. And we're talking about, you know, a minute builds or two minutes builds. But, but I agree with you 100%. We're talking about a fast feedback loop. But we're talking about the same test that you would execute yourself on your own computer while you're working. So that's what we're executing. And if that is okay, then your branch is automatically merged into the integration branch. Right? So we integrate it into the integration branch. We run the test. If the test is, success, is successful, we push it back to a region. If it's not successful, we just remove it. Right? So there's no trace that we ever tried to get in there, which basically means that, that you are always working up against an automated process that implements your definition of done. So I have, a hard, I have really a hard time seeing why this is not continuous integration, because you can do that 10 times per day if you want. So, uh, Ove, do you, you know, there, there are things here around uh, what Lars is saying that might, you, one might make a case that it's slowing down the feedback loop because they have to do something before they push it. Do you want to, do you want to talk to that? Yeah. 
Uh, yes, uh, I would like to do that. Um, there are there are actually several discussions now in in, in play here, and, and one of them is talking about the branching strategy, and and another one is talking about uh, the need for pre-commit uh, check-in. Right. Um, there are also this idea that was now, and I know that this has been written about, but it was also introduced now about this uh, benevolent uh, dictator development model that is often used in in open source and free software. Linux is a typical example of that. Uh, and these are all kind of three, while they are linked, they are three kind of different discussions. So I would like to start on the, on the branching thing, uh, whether it's a feature branch or a development branch or whatever. But we, in, in our um, development environment, with, uh, we probably have approximately 200 people that write code every day. And they are working on the same main, main trunk, all of them. Uh, and we typically have uh, around 200 commits per day, so on average. It's, there are some people that commit several times per day, and some people that only commit um, once in a while. But still, we have a fairly high flow going into the uh, code base. And it's not really a problem that everyone is working on the, uh, in, on, in the same branch, the main trunk. But when we are looking for kind of symptoms for bad things happening in the development uh, of our software, what we're looking for is when you have individuals or teams that prefer to create their own kind of cozy sandbox where they can work by themselves without being disturbed by everyone else. Uh, and that is kind of by definition a branch. Um, and, and once that starts happening, we see it more and more. It starts happening. Uh, more and more groups wants to kind of create this cozy place where they can just not be disturbed by anyone else, bring a cup of coffee, headphones on, and have a good time for a few days or maybe a few weeks, and then start to, uh, to integrate. And of course, everyone wants to avoid that situation, but ha kind of uh, supporting and and uh, recommending uh, branching as a strategy is is to a larger extent allowing this uh, very negative thing uh, to happen. So if you can make main trunk a very attractive place to be, so that all teams and developers feel that yes, I do want to commit directly into the main trunk. I do want to be a part of 200 developers integrating all the time together and doing the, well, the integration, doing the testing, and sometimes doing the deployment so that we can actually use the real thing. Um, then that is what you, you want to aim for. So, um, so while sometimes you have to branch, um, it's it's not something you should kind of support, and certainly not create a model uh, out of and, and as a recommended practice because it's it's not um, yes. Okay, so you you wanted to talk about three things, Olve, but I I think it was really valuable that you split those into split split this discussion to the three different yeah. um, concepts. So if we just stick with branching, uh, just just for a moment. Um, and I'm wondering if you know any any of the other three would like to make a case for why why a branching model why, you know, what branching model might encourage uh, development teams to do. So, for instance, Dave, have you seen examples where um, just by using branches, it's moved people away from continuous integration? Or yes. Mike, have you seen it working? You know, so, Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I I think that's a big part. I think I think always always made made a really important point there. So, so I, I think I think there's a lot that Lars talks about that I can agree with. I, I, I have no, um, I have no religious stance on pre on pre pre commit builds. Um, if you want to automate that, the thing the, the, and 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 implementing those using branches, that's fine. But the way that I see that is that at the point of commit, from the developer's perspective, the point at which they submit their changes to the magic engine that's going to evaluate them. 
The rest is implementation detail. If you're using a bunch of branches at that point to evaluate those changes and, and figure out, that's fine. As long as those, as long as that's a synchronization point, as long as there aren't going to be crossover merges, you're not trying to do this in parallel, which brings a whole stack of other problems. I think that's fine. The stuff that concerns me is the stuff on the developer's workstation, and, and as as you say, the implications for that for 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 teams when they choose to have little, you know, private groups of people sharing code, back channels communicating. That's not going through continuous integration. That it's bypassing continuous integration. That's dangerous, and in my experience, that's the commonest use of feature branching. That's so. So my my argument against feature branching, I can't really argue against an individual de developer choosing to use a local feature branch, committing multiple times a day to uh, to uh, uh, Origin Master. I can't understand what 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 benefit you get from doing that it seems like a waste of time and extra complexity to me uh, it's not how I would prefer to work but okay that sounds like continuous integration as long as that developer is the only person using that branch and as soon as they've got the changes they're committing them to origin master that's that's fine um, but that's not how most people seem to use feature branches as far as I see my in my my um, my experience is that uh, you get what what, what Alva is talking about. You get teams back, um, doing back channels, avoiding continuous integration. You get long-lived feature branches where people are developing a whole feature for days, sometimes weeks on end before committing. And all of those are bad practices. And I think the more that we talk about feature branching, so so I think what I'm saying. There are ways of using branches that are compatible with continuous integration, and I have no strong objection to those, although I see I don't really see where the value is. Um, but that's not how most people end up using it. Most people end up using it, as the name suggests, as a, as a branch that lives as long as the feature does. And, um, and, and, and that is absolutely against the continuous integration, which I think we'd all agree. Yeah, I mean, and they Dave, might. I agree. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I've seen I've seen the abuse of feature branches as well. I've seen feature branches span more than a year and never actually make it. You know, they were they were they never made it to be production quality, and they were just abandoned. There was a huge waste in that. So I understand the the fear and the the risks involved. I understand all those things, but the thing is, with with a distributed version control system like Git, you essentially have that anyway. Like Ol was saying, some developers are very good at making lots of small commits, and others, actually, they are in their own little sandbox. And they'll do every, every morning, they might come in and do a pull rebase on master, and they'll get their changes brought along with, with what's going on. And in a sense, you can do that both ways, right? When you're using Git as your version control system, you can have your own little sandbox regardless of whether you make a feature branch or not. and in, in fact, you, your own master is your local feature branch. So, I mean, I understand. Uh, it's a difficult message, especially when you've got 200 developers to be able to send, yeah, you can make branches, but only the right kind of branches, and they're only to last for a couple of seconds and do the right thing, guys. Because then you're asking people to make smart judgments on these things, and they might take the wrong idea. On the other hand, there are a lot of adva advantages to using this kind of branching model in the sense that you can actually deliver features as one package in a way. I mean, you can squash that those little feature branches and deliver them in one way. Um, so, I don't think I don't think we're actually in disagreement here. I think it's just that uh, the the traditional uh, idea of feature branches are, are so harmful that there's kind of there's almost a toxic reaction to the, the word feature branch. And maybe maybe even that's the wrong term for what we're describing. Uh, but, but what you just said about squashing multiple feature branches to, you know, that, that, sa that sounds like hiding change again to me. That doesn't no. sound like continuous integration. Hey, we're not, we're not squashing feature branches, we're squashing commits. So a, a typical work scenario, say, if I if I work in Git, a distributed version control system, and I'm and, and I'm not using um, 
branches, which means that in my local clone, I'll be working on my master branch, and I will uh, deliver it to my origin master. Those are two branches, right? So they could have any name, right? It, well, one of them is obviously supposed to be origin master, because that's where you're supposed to end up. But while you're working in your own local clone, you're working on master. So what happens if you commit something, and then you do a test and say, ah, oh, that doesn't work. So you'll, you'll give it another go. No, that doesn't work either. And then you'll give it another go. Yeah, OK, there you have it. In your, in your third attempt, right? So now you have three commits in your local master. You just created them, right? But they're actually, they're actually just you know, three different attempts to solve the issue. It's just the way that you work, right? Uh, so now you want to deliver them. Actually, these three commits, uh, if you want to do a nice delivery, uh, if you were in an open source environment where you had a benevolent dictator, right, and somebody came and said, well, I got this solution, you know, I added this uh, feature, I, I, I created this uh, bug fix for, for something that was on there, and I got these four commits, and I, you know, there, you know, it's the accumulated results for these four commits that I would like to, to, to deliver. So the, the benevolent dictator of that community would say, "Yeah, I hear what you're saying, but you know what? You got to squash them into one because I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, com I'm not gonna rev you four, you know, different commits that are supposed to be accumulated. Could you please accumulate them for me, right? So, so you would be expected to deliver one package with the solution, right? If you don't do that, what happens is that all your commits effectively will end up on the original master." But it's actually only the last one of them that is the accumulated result of your commits that is actually supposed to represent a solution, because all the other ones, they're just intermediate steps. But, but this is how Git works. So actually, these commits will, all of them, end up on the master branch. Even if they're complete, if somebody goes back and finds any arbitrary commit on master and say, OK, master is always building, right? It never breaks, so I can take an arbitrary commit, and then I can just build that. But that is not true if you have actually developed it the way that I just described it. So one of the benefits you get from having a branch in your local clone is that you can have your local uh, clone there, and you can have one commit and another commit and, and, and another commit. And then at that point, when, when we deliver it, we're actually squashing it into just one commit. Right? Or, or you can deliver, the developer can do it themselves. But the, but the point being that you're actually delivering a package. This has no effect if you're actually spending two hours or two years on delivering it. It's the same principle, right? I don't want three commits if you are, if you are conceptually only delivering one. Then I just want one. So, so, so Lars, so now I think that's the point where we differ because that's not continuous integration for me. So I mean, can, I, can I just clarify, Lars, before, before we go on? Yeah. Is that squashing multiple commits into a single commit to, to, um, to encapsulate, wrap up a package? Would you say that that is either the value or one of the major values of the Jodra workflow that you've recommended? It, it's 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 certainly one of the things that we would recommend people to do. But then again, it's considered you know a, 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 a fairly you know a high level thing to do, right? The, the average Git user would not you know uh, normally uh, squash their commits or or you know clean up their workspace before they deliver it or squash it into one commit. So, so this is one of the features we get from, from, from what we have created, is that if, if you are not you know, squashing your commits uh, yourself, uh, so what this workflow offers you to do is to do it for you. So it will effectively be one delivery, right? And, and it is, I mean, David, it is continuous delivery. I mean, you can do this every hour if you want, or you can do it every third minute, right? It, it, it has nothing to do with, with speed or feedback loop. The, these are basically just, you know, Git technicalities. You must remember that. Well, I, I, I disagree, and 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 just to be clear, I like I use Git like everybody else, so I'm not ta I'm not talking about this as being ignorant to no, no, no. distributed version control systems. Um, I can fully concede that when I'm working on my local, you know, on my um, local clone of uh, of the repo that, that that's a, that that's a branch that's fine but that's the point you know I want to integrate that branch with origin master that's the shared picture the shared state with everybody else as frequently as I can continue as Mike Roberts once said continuous is a lot more often than you think I want I, I want you know my my classic cycle 
if, if I've got an efficient build, my normal working cycle is write a test, see it fail, write some code to see it pass, so refactor the code, commit, move on to the next test. I'm committing probably once every 10 or 15 minutes usually in that cycle, maybe, maybe more frequently than that if I'm going quickly. Um, if I'm if I'm doing if, if I'm if I'm working on a separate branch and I'm I'm working at that rate, that's an impediment because I've got more instructions to give Git in order to 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 you know merge my, merge my merge no. my stuff and get get you know a no, master up not, to date. That it? is not that's not true, uh, Dave. It's the same no. command. Basically, what if you were in Git and you would say Git push uh, origin master, right? Mm -hmm. So. If I was, I, if it, so, the flow that we have created, so git push origin master. So it, it puts your local master into the origin, right? So that's the command. It's, it's a one line command. So it's, mm -hmm. it's almost the same command that I run. That it's just that we have a naming convention saying that any branch that ends, ends up in, in the origin uh, clone that has a special name, you can pick that by yourself, but we, are, we're, we have a tendency to use the, the, the keyword ready. So any branch that is, that is uh, prefixed with the word ready means that it should be automatically integrated. So this is the flag that I'm raising to my benevolent dictator saying, I want in, right? So right now I could be working on a local branch called LAS, okay? So I would say git push a region, and I would say my local branch LAS colon into ready slash last. So it's, it's, a, it's a one line commit. It, it's, it's no different from what you're doing. It still sounds like more typing to me than just saying git push. <laughs> but but, 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 it, but it's, 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 it's one line command that says what you want to do. I, I, I mean, yeah, you just can do an alias for that if you want to. Okay, okay. Um, let, but let, nevertheless, so, but, but, but if that's the case and you're always doing that, why not work on master? Why, why, and then, then your master, your master uh, branch is up to date. That, 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 that is because I actually want to clean up the, uh, the commits that we're delivering. So, so that, that, would be, that would be because there might be more than one commit in there, right? People yeah, do so that. That's, that's yeah. my point. That's my point. Mm -hmm. So that's the point at which it seems to me that that's not continuous integration. If if each of those commits has not made it to origin master, then it's not continuous integration because you've made you thought you were ready to commit, you've committed to your local repo, but you haven't pushed it to origin master. But that's another thing. I mean, for me working with with version control systems all my career, saying that if 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 you really have you know a strategy for for keeping everything, every single change. Even how insignificant it may have been, a, even if it was just you thinking that you were finished, and then two minutes later you figured out that you know, Mr. Semicolon. If you are about to change or to save every single change that that you have made historically in the version control system, even if it's completely useless, right? You need to have a strategy for only saving the things that are actually useless, useful. Because yeah, if you save everything, that's, that's in the end, you clutter up your version control system. Yeah, but that's the that's the point at which you commit. So, so as you as you correctly say, your local repo is a branch. You work on that branch until you're happy that it's ready to commit, and then you commit and push it to origin. Mm -hmm. So you know, but you're you're, you're clarify, adding an extra stage where you're doing multiple commits before you push to origin. So that so it's not continuous you're, by no, definition. I'm not doing that. I'm continuous. not doing that. I, this just this is just a pattern that we see from software developers. So I'm so so. So it, it's just what we see. I mean, when we, when we help people implement Git, and this remember, this is where we came from because we're on the we are on the exact same page uh, as far as as talking about. We need only one. We can only accept one long-lived branch. There is there is no more than one long-lived branch. And anybody yes. who is working on on a feature branch uh, who isn't committing or integrating uh, daily, they're basically not committing, right? They're not contributing to anything and any employee in in my organization who is not contributing is about to get sacked right so 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 it, it's it's not an option you have to work in an isolated workspace you are supposed to deliver right it's the seventh principle of the agile manifesto right that the primary measure of progress is running code if you are not supposed to deliver if you are not capable of delivering running code every day then you're not part of the team right so that's it so so that we're not debating that and I, yeah. I, I'm, I have a name for what you call a trunk-based development, 
So we call it a release train. That's another term that is that is quite common. Actually, you have a release train. That that's also a term that indicates that you only have one long lift branch, and you're supposed to end up on that branch. So we're working the exact same strategy, right? So everything that we're talking about, I agree with you completely. The only thing where we do not agree is how to implement this in Git. And since we have been spending a lot of time helping people implement Git, because that is how, what people approach us for. Can you help us set up Git? Yes, we can do that. And then they come with the, with the, uh, with the Git flow, the, uh, the, 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 the blog post out there, you know, the successful branching strategy for Git, which is rubbish because it has two long-lived branches. You've got master and you've got develop. You've got two long-lived branches. How on earth would you maintain that? It's unmaintainable. So what we have done is basically we have said there is only one long-lived branch, and that is master. And now we help you get into master, and we automate sure. everything. So, so I, I, I guess, I guess the point, I guess the point is, so I, I think we are largely in agreement. I think, I think that we are, we're, we're agreeing in, in terms of what our definition of continuous integration is. We're agreeing in terms of, you know, um, the, the need to, 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 to be evaluating our changes free, as frequently as we can, um, you know, on on our you know in our sh uh, shared space, um, I guess I you know I guess the point the point where we we differ is going back to always point, which is which is I think that the me the message the way that you're talk the, the way that you present it and talk about it the message is the message to understand what continuous integration is in that context is more nuanced, and my experience is that. Most people aren't going to get that nuance. You know, most 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 developers are going to be reading the the, the, the branch the branch support in in distributed VCSs like Git and Mercurial. They're going to be they're going to be seeing those differently. They're going to see them as 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 useful for long leaf. And you've described you've described your stuff as as a means of. Albeit short term, I I concede that, but a, a means of delaying the commit point, the sh the sharing point, the integration point, until you have a series of commits. And I think you know at that point it's a little nuanced as to what's the point at which that goes too far and is no longer continuous integration, and what's the point at which at which it's a good strategy, you know, um, I, I think um, you're right. work by an effective software developer. I think you're right. There is a nuance to what you call trunk. You and Steve call trunk-based development, and what we call release train. I think we see we see the branch, uh, the integration branch, as a as a as a release strategy, where I think you and Steve perhaps see it more as a collaboration strategy. So so, and we would like to honor the re the the integration branch to be part of the release strategy. That is why we continue to refer to the benevolent dictator governance model. Right, like you see it in the open uh, open source environments, because then it becomes part of of, of how you are supposed to actually uh, qualify the things that are on the on the branch. So it's it's not a collaboration model as such; it's a release model, right? So it's it's where I keep my uh, release candidates. Whereas you you see it as a way. So one of the things I have I I I I, I suspect. Is that you call it trunk-based software development, and to my knowledge, the only version control system that has uh, that has named the integration branch trunk is a version. So I I imagine that what you call trunk-based software development must somehow derive from a subversion-oriented approach to software development, and I can easily understand why anybody working in subversion would not want to create a single branch. So I'm, 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 I'm completely. Sorry. I'm sorry. I think you have the wrong end of the stick there. I, that, 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 so, so first, it's not what I call it; it's what Steve calls it. But, 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 um, but it's accept, it's acceptable. But, but I think I think trunk is a common name for for master. You know, the the, the shared in, in space, and it just means that it has no other no other connotation. I think I, I don't I don't think it means it certainly doesn't mean any more than that to me. And it, this isn't. I don't think this is subversion related. I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure that. Uh, I can't remember what the first one, first version control system I used um, with continuous integration, but it predated Subversion. Um, so, so I, 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 I think it, uh, that's just semantics, and that's 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 that, that, that's not a real objection. I agree with you that that Steve and I, I think, would see 
um, continuous integration as a communication strategy. But that's part of its value. That's why it's important because there are types of merges that you know, there are you know, semantic clashes. So your merging tools will be able to merge things fine, but there are clashes that will only be detected by your tests. And so having good test coverage and evaluating your changes against all of those tests on a regular and frequent basis, a continuous basis, is part of the strategy. That's kind of why it works. So I think it is a, I do see it as a communication strategy. It's not just a release strategy. It's also about communicating with your with the developers that you're working alongside. Olvi. Uh, yes. Um, I think you offer too much, David, when you say that you, you kind of agree with each other because uh, I hear two different uh, worlds here uh, discussing. Uh, so it's very kind of you to say that, uh, Lars, and you agree. But I, I see that, as I see it, it's different. Um, and it's, uh, there are so many things. I, I've read the article, I've seen the diagram, and now when I hear about this uh, benevolent uh, dictator development model, you haven't mentioned gated commits yet, but uh, that will probably come in. Um, and also when you talk about it, there is imp it's important with a strategy uh, for how to do continuous integration. I, I have to say this, is, uh, this would be a large step backwards for us if we were going to, to implement this into, into our uh, software development flow. Um, we don't have an imposed strategy that people are supposed to follow. We, what we do is to make sure that it's so attractive to be part of, uh, to be integrating continuously all the time that people want to do it. We even have this kind of Internally, we have this saying that whenever you start kind of a new project, you can choose whatever lang program language you want. You can choose your own version control system. You can choose your own build system. You can do whatever you want in order to achieve that uh, your goal of your project. But we have to make sure that our main development workflow is so nice to work with that everybody wants to be part of that workflow and they want to kind of to do every small commit, they want to put it into the main, what we call the main trunk, uh, all all the but time. I, but I get and and similarly, I agree with you all. And, and similarly, I, the, this I, idea of gated commits, which will we, hopefully will will um, uh, come to um, come to, is would be kind of preventing uh, this atmosphere of I want to be in this place. <laughs> But I, I don't understand why, because I, I, I think I said almost the same sentence as you, as you just did. So, so in that, we, we completely agree, right? The only place you want to be is the integration branch. There is no other way that it can count. If you, if you don't get into the integration branch, you're not part of the team. That's so simple, right? So we agree 100% on that. So, so I, I, but I, and that's one of the things I also mentioned this to Steve in, in, uh, in the reply to his comments. But so I, actually, I don't understand. Is that because you don't believe that I believe it? But but because I really do believe it. it the only there is only one long lived branch, and it's the only place you want to be. So we do not disagree on that. But now, but now I, I, I um, when I talk about uh, when I heard you mention uh, about this uh, strategy, I don't know how that was supposed to be kind of recommended or promoted or or uh, implemented, but. When I look at how 200 developers are working together in our workflow, there are some people that are committing locally to their machine. There are some groups that create their own branches by themselves and then wait for days and days and maybe weeks before they are committing into main trunk. And okay. that, this is but we, we oh, agree that that's something sure. that they can do, and, and our job then is to make sure that it's so attractive to be in the main track that they, they to a lesser and lesser extent, feel that it's okay. But I just feel somehow the, that, that, that my viewpoints are being taken hostage a little bit because it seems like that you're putting me words in my mouth saying that I am in favor of ping, people isolating themselves on feature branches. I never said that. that but, we're fighting that. Intensely, so 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 it's not what we're trying to do here. But what is this branching strategy that, or this strategy that you are recommending uh, to your clients then? Yes, but but how, but how, do, you, how do you kind of promote that idea? 
but that but that's basically the same thing as what you are saying. You are calling it trunk based. Okay, they, Steve is calling it trunk based, right? But but it's the same conceptual idea that there is only long one long lived branch. You need to be on that branch and you need to be integrated into that branch daily. So that's conceptually the same thing, right? So it's just that we are utilizing some of the features in Git to optimize the flow, and we are automating it. I I agree with that. But the thing is that we're, it's it's not like a gated commit in the sense that that you're supposed to uh, slow down your feedback loop. We have the exact same uh, focus on feedback loop as you have, right? So uh, so uh, what is what is the uh, prerequisite for a, a, a software developer for him to be allowed to enter code into the integration branch? Uh, typically, there is either some kind of formal test uh, that you're supposed to run, or you have a gentleman agreement with your colleagues saying you cannot put code on the integration branch unless it can, I don't know, if unless it can build or unless you know it can you know pass the unit test or whatever, right? Well, we have uh, uh, you might call it uh, a gentleman agreement, but we what we try to do is to make sure that everyone feels like a professional and they are not only allowed to but if they are sure they are even encouraged to check in things that they haven't tested. Um, if, if they know that this is not going to break anything they can check it in. Mm -hmm. But all the tools that we run pre-commit, no post-commit, they are also available for the developer um, yes. so he can use it if he wants to. But our flow is not different. Big point from, from to make right. sure that they don't have to run the test, and they are not. They they don't submit something into a machine that do some checking before the integration process starts, because that will slow down feedback by several seconds, minutes, or or sometimes even hours. But uh, that's something I object to. Over, I don't yeah. see how. Integrating the code and then building it is any faster than building it and then integrating it oh, in no, terms so. of the feedback loop. At it's the end of the day, you don't you don't get a feedback loop because you managed to successfully push it. If That's you not have, feedback. If you have twenty products that depends on your source code and each of them have multiple versions, so maybe you have fifty builds that needs to be done. Um, asking a developer to do that before committing. Uh, it's basically too much, and and suddenly you you are asking the developer to understand all the products. No, all we're the not products that I maybe never have heard of. No, no, no. Yeah, exactly. I agree. That's, that's, our that's, point that's point. not what we're suggesting, though. We're not saying you have to. It's not like we say you have to do all your builds, all your release train, all your static analysis, all your functional tests before you can get into integration. It's basically what you decide as your. I mean, it could be something as simple as does it have a Commit message, you know. If that's if that's what your your told criteria is, I think even that part, even that is silly to to kind of uh, make a pre uh, kind of a gate uh, a rule saying that you can't commit, because if if a professional really wants to do that, that should be okay. But it, it should of course hurt him. Uh, that was about so kind of the peer pressure uh, of uh, you don't want to kind of misbehave either. Yeah, yeah, but you're going to build all these things no, anyway. You have to. Sorry, go ahead, Dave. No, no, please. Yeah, I, I just uh, I failed to see how having having a, a quick smoke test before before something is shared with 200 developers isn't a good idea. It's uh, it's something that the, the professional and the developer should do himself because he wants to do it, not because there is uh, well. A consultancy company that has come in and, and kind of <laughs> uh, and sold it to management and said this is a good way of doing it. So, is it would it be fair to say that that we're coming up against some things that, to do with the different organisations that people work with? So, Olbe, you're you're working in Cisco with a team of developers that, to some extent, uh, you've brought up through the ranks over the past eleven years. You know, highly committed uh, people who you're who you're working with to try and make. Um, to keep very professional. Yeah. Um, speaking as a consultant myself, I've experienced the fact that consultancies are often called into organizations where maybe the skill level and level of professionalism among the staff isn't quite so high. Yeah. Have we? Is this something that might be coloring our different perspectives? So Dave, I don't actually know um, what your current um, 
the, the, the people that you're working with, what's, what sort of organizations you're working with. So do you think that's something that might be playing into this, this sort of area of disagreement? Uh, I, 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 think, I think it might be. I, I think there are certainly differences with different organizations. And um, I, I have implemented both of these strategies in different auto, automations. I've implemented both um, post-commit um, uh, validation and pre-commit validation. And uh, on it, I, 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 I don't really see Olve's point of it slowing down the process, and I don't really see that that's, you know, that, that either one seems acceptable to me. Um, but it probably depends on the technology and the team, that, you know, the, 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 the time and the build. But the last team where I worked with the pre-commit um, build, it actually sped up the, the cycle quite considerably. Um, uh, because it meant it, because we were using technologies that were a little less tractable, that you know, didn't compile quite as quickly, and, and uh, as as Java and C sharp and those sorts of things, and so so it was it, was, it worked well in that circumstance. So we, we could have a shared build which we could optimize. We could we could throw hardware at it to be very efficient. We could do incremental build techniques, cache, caching things, all of that kind of stuff um, to get a fast feedback loop. And if the build failed, the code, the, the change wasn't promoted to master and so didn't pollute everybody else's view of the repository. And we, we went through the trans transition of kind of classic human stroke technology mix style CI, where you've got the human processes managing CR, CI. We, we, we went through the, the process of transitioning from that to the pre-commit build and actually the pre-commit pre Build was more efficient in terms of the amount of time spent with commits. We were able to get more commits through uh, once we moved to the pre-commit. So, so I don't. I I think that I think that both can work. Um, I think that um, I can't see any particular need to compromise the, the testing or the validation or or the the feedback time uh, with 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 either strategy. Um, I'm not quite sure that whether whether it matters whether the developers are, uh, are are excellent or average either. I'm not quite sure it really matters. I think that in order to set it up and have it working well, um, that takes a little bit more thought to get the pre-commit working smoothly. But um, uh, but I, I think it I think it works. I think both work equally well. The um, the human the, the traditional human Process technology approach to CI takes a little bit, bit more buy-in. You, you know, you're able to enforce it a little bit more with pre-commit builds. Is the only thing, the only thing that I would recognise. And so, if you've got um, a, a developer population who are uh, um, less than keen on on the um, on continuous integration, uh, the pre-commit build might enforce it a bit more strongly. I suppose. Are you using pre-commits in your current? Um, uh, assignment. Uh, I, I don't. I don't have a single current assignment. So I, I, I see. I, I see a mix of things. Um, so so some some pre commits and some. I think the majority are kind of human centered, um, uh, classic CI kind of style. Can I can I ask for your feedback on on a on a slide we sometimes use to present this to our to our customers who like you Cisco. Is typically actually quite large, you know, industrial manufacturing industries that are, you know, creating embedded software and actually has, you know, a factory approach that just happened to have software in it, right? But with, I can, can you see my, um, can you see my screen here? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. As long as you're talking, we can see it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep showing. Oh, so this is I just take you through it, you know, uh, pretty pretty fast. So what you have, it's kind of it's kind of you know uh, 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 a vision of the the agile approach here that that we're trying to help people with setting up their continuous integration and their continuous delivery pipeline. It shows you in the top right corner that you, you take a task wherever you pick that from your Kanban board or or your uh, Scrum process or whatever, but you have a task and you give that to your software developer. He starts working on it. It takes only a few hours, and then he says, "I'm done. It works on my computer." 
And actually, he's been working at this point in an isolated workspace, whether that is master or whatever you call it. But but he's done. It works on his computer. He would like to share that with his colleagues, right? So he's starting the, the continuous integration process. Basically, he needs to do some kind of magic in the version control system. It doesn't differ if it's our process or if it's yours, right? Because he's currently in a private workspace, and he needs to put that into uh, the... Uh, the uh, the common workspace, so he needs to push to a region, right? So 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 as I said, we are ad advocating for the benevolent dictator governance model, but but we are replacing the benevolent dictator with a willing serf, right? That could be Jenkins or Go or Bamboo or Team City or whatever, but but we have an automated process there that would do the work of a benevolent dictator. So so Jenkins in our case. Uh, would see that something has happened in the version control system because it monitors the origin uh, clone in Git uh, or the centralized repository if it's if it's a such. And then it says, okay, there's a guy there. He wants the integration. And the integration, so, so an automated process starts, and that starts by the integration. It's pretty simple. The integration is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a common three-way merge, right? So, so it's basically whatever I have in my workspace does it work, merge into the workspace that I'm trying to hit as my target. And in most cases, it will, right? And I say in 99.9%. .9 so it, it's not the merge process that is a problem because we're, we're coming from the same place as you are, right? So we, we advocate that people should do this fairly often, right? Every second hour, right? Or at least in workspaces where they do not clutter up with their colleagues. So it's not the integration that's the process. But anyway, we need to do it because it needs to be done, okay? But we automated it. Then you need to do a build. This is what we refer to as, you know, your gentleman agreement, right? All the way in, you say, well, we're just supposed to, to do the right thing, right? We don't, we don't actually define what that is, but you're going you're gonna to do the right thing. It's a Dory principle, right? That we say, okay, Actually, we make it a little bit formal and say, well, the code is supposed to build, right? So it's, it's supposed to, if it's a compilable code, you should be able to compile it. And, and if it's not compilable, if it's Ruby or Python, whatever, you should come up with a test, you know, that is kind of similar to that. It, it should, you know, be semantically and, and, and syntactically okay, right? Um, but you can also put in quotation marks because you could also, at this point, if you want to, include that in your gentleman agreement and say, okay, and I have a small test suite I want to execute as well. So I got, you know, like 16 seconds of unit testing as well or whatever. I don't know, but this, this is your toll gate criteria. This is your gentleman agreement. We're talking a build that will execute within minutes, right? So it's the exact same time that it takes for you to run this build on your local computer. So, so we have not jeopardized the feedback loop yet, right? It's the same thing, but it's automated. And what happens if this, you know, continuous integration process is, uh, which is automated, if that is accepted, then your code actually ends up on the master branch, right? And as soon as something new ends up on your master branch, the continuous delivery pipeline starts. And that is, obviously, that also needs to be speeded up. But you cannot guarantee that to finish within seconds because you want to do a lot of things. You want to do all your analysis, all your metrics. You want to make sure that you can deploy to a, a production-like environment. You want to run your automated functional test, and you want to see that your documentation without spelling errors, and maybe you even want to ship that to a customer to do an exploratory test. I don't know what you want to do, but this is your definition of done, right, in your context. It might take a few hours, it might take a few days, but it's certainly not going to take, you know, uh, a quarter of a year, right? So your pipeline is supposed to be fast, but there's no way that you can ask a, a software developer to do this every time he's committing into master, because it might take a few hours, right? So we're not asking that. But basically, once he delivered something into the integration branch, the, the pipeline starts and then it will continue and continue and continue, and hopefully it will end up uh, with actually uh, uh, showing that you are you have met your definition of done, and and you are indeed done done. If anything goes wrong in that process, the automated process, whatever the the automation platform, whatever that is, will give you the feedback, right? So you'll get the message from Go or from Bamboo or from Jenkins or Team City saying, "Hope oh, your functional test is failing." And then, okay, so you just pick up on there and say, okay, I need to fix the test then. 
Obviously, all these uh, things are automated, so you have them available on your computer. So there's nothing preventing you from actually running the functional test on your own computer if you want to do that. But you can also not do that if you do not want to do that, because you can just commit, and then it will be part of the automated process that follows. This is what we advocate. And this is the, this is the work scheme that we uh, advocate. This is what we implement. And for this, we utilize the Git flow. Well, the automated Git flow, our Git flow, not the one that you described. Okay, so I mean that was. Thank you for for sharing that diagram with us. That that does chime in and mesh with my understanding of the workflow that Joshua have um, that has been publicised and published on the Joshua website. Uh, we've been talking for about an hour now, and I think that's probably long enough. Uh, <laughs> I I think I don't I don't sense that anyone's changed their positions. Uh, I wonder if it would be a great idea uh, we just go around quickly for one sentence sum up from each of you and then maybe if you feel moved to write about it or try and distill this down into uh, into into something that is consumable by others you know maybe we have another discussion if that seems meaningful or useful but otherwise I think it's been really interesting and I'd just like to go in the same order through people and get a one sentence summary of what you've heard and what you've thought uh, this evening. So, if we could start with you, please, Dave. I'm going to struggle with one sentence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you put a lot um, of semicolons in it. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm afraid I haven't changed my position. I, I think I think that I think that there are some subtle some subtleties and. Primarily, I guess the objection that I have is um, is that I think this sends a bad message to people that aren't familiar with some of the new nuances of continuous integration. I think this is harder to explain to those people, and I think I I, I really don't like the, the 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 killer use case that that Lars expresses, which is that. I can make lots of local commits before pushing to uh, to, to continuous integration. That's that that's the thing that I'm trying to avoid. I want to make lots of pushes to continuous integration. I don't want the local commits. And if if I have some of those, it means I've done something wrong. So so I still think that this is less continuous integration than pushing to a shared resource uh, every time that I logically commit whatever commit means. Thank you, Lars. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I think from from uh, from a conceptual uh, viewpoint, you know, talking about continuous delivery and continuous integration and uh, minimize work in progress and having only one long-lived branch, and I, I see a lot of similarities in what we're saying. And uh, basically, I just think if, if we want to go to the same place, it's, it's basically just a matter if you want to go there in a the brand new Tesla S80 or if you want to go there in an old, you know, old Volkswagen, right? So, so I think that we're just basically trying to automate things. We're we're, we're basically trying to to uh, to uh, to find out where is all the cute work, where is all the manual work in the, in the process. Then we and then we're going to automate that and, and make that available to the uh, to the software developers as an automated process that is that is there for them to utilize in any way they want. The branching strategy that has been uh, kind of. Uh, the kickstart for this uh, setup, saying, "Well, branching is evil." Uh, I, I really think that branches are being taken hostage here. It is not about branching; it is really about continuous integration followed by continuous delivery. Branches is not a part of the equation. There are many ways you can implement this, it, and it doesn't really matter. So, and so, so, the, so the idea that branches are evil, I, I truly do not believe in that. Thank you. Mike? Okay. Um, for me, it seems like the objections to this fall, I mean, they obviously fall into two main areas. One is that we don't like pre-testing because it slows feedback, and the other is we don't like branches because people can abuse them. Um, for me, I mean, actually, I'm going to take all of his words out of his mouth. He, he gave this, during the conference he talked, he, he said something very important to me, and I've never heard it uh, actually articulated before, he says, you should optimize your system for the top 10% of your developers. No, top 90%. That's what I say. Oh, really? Okay. I got that all wrong then. 
<laughs> you optimize okay. it for the top 90% because a lot of uh, systems they are optimized for kind of the rubbish developers. So uh, make sure that right. your 90% best developers they are actually feeling having a good time, and then you can deal with others. Exactly. Another way. So I mean that's what I'm thinking about this this whole approach to branches. I mean. You probably thought about that in terms of pre-testing, but I thought about that story in terms of branches, where, I mean, dealing with branches and actually distributed version control is really, you're asking developers to make a lot of judgment calls, hmm. and uh, they, can, they can get those calls wrong. And I've seen, I've seen the negative effects of those on large projects, and so I understand that, that fear. But I've also seen the benefits of being able to rewrite history locally, have lots of small intermediate commits while you're working with a, a local undo before you actually publish your changes. And I think a lot of the best people w that use Git take that kind of approach where they have the, they use, use Git locally as their local scratch pad, creating lots of uh, fine grain commits, super fine grain commits, uh, and then they'll go back and rewrite the history before they push into something because at the end of the day, the Git log is your communication tool. So I think that I, I'm more inclined to say branches are here. We're using distributed version control. They're here to stay. This is the way it is. So I, I think that we can't say branches good or bad as long as we're always integrating. I think that's the, the key point. And uh, about the pre-testing, I, I don't see I don't see how generating feedback can if you like delay feedback because if if you okay the other you can do no testing before you allow merge and what's the negative effect is that your 200 developers all pull broken code maybe that's not such a big deal because you can revert quickly but still it has a cost and people have to uh, wonder what they're pulling and what is what is what is it is this the right thing to pull and, and so on so I, I think that I'm much more fond of having some kind of pre-testing to say that well, you know, if you're on the master integration branch, and that's exactly where you want to commit, that place is the home, that's your target, you want to get there as often as you can, then you don't want to be, you want to be pretty clear that that's, that's a good place to be, and pre-testing can help there. So that's the way I see it. Okay, thanks, Mike. And Ove, um, a wrap-up from you, please. Yeah, um, yeah when we talk about pretesting we are of course talking about the difference between mandatory pretesting because of course you should test before you commit uh, the difference between mandatory and uh, optional is that if it's optional then you're growing professionalism um, and, and, and anyway um, when when Lars presented this kind of uh, stages uh, and the flow and the stages going I was uh, Kind of looking at that diagram and said, well, why, why stop at the, the build uh, after it has compiled? Why don't you kind of delay the integration until uh, it's done, done, uh, since everything is automated there? And and I, that is kind of a sliding slope thing because it's it, it kind of illustrates that this, to some extent, it is delaying the integration, even if it's just by uh, by a few seconds or, or minute, it is actually uh, something that is delaying the integration. And, and that is uh, what I, it looks like the weak point of, uh, of the model. Uh, um, but uh, of course we, we agree on, on everything about like uh, we want uh, this continuous uh, integration, we want to focus on value instead of work and uh, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, main trunk, uh, which I like to call it, uh, is an attractive uh, place to be. Uh, so what we are differing on is how do you, how do you kind of get to this point? And I would say the most important thing you should focus on is how do you grow your developers into becoming responsible developers that uh, always consider the effect of what they are doing uh, together with all the other developers. Um, and, and, and whatever you can do to grow professionalism is probably a good thing and whatever you can do to kind of reduce the number of seconds it takes from the developer decides now I have decided that I want to integrate 
then you should make sure that you don't waste any microseconds in starting to give real feedback that this is properly integrated. And, and on that thought, I think we'll say thank you without wasting any more microseconds. The feedback is, thanks very much, guys. That was really interesting. Thank you, thanks, guys. guys.